بسم آبو و ولد و منفس قدوس احادو املاك Greetings, this is Rasia Dinos Tafari, Salam to Tainai Sterling. And we'd like to discuss the fitna Nagast and um, Islamic law, what's known as Sharia law. Now, the fitna Nagast is also known as the law of kings. And we're going to be referencing uh, the mission, the mission by Hans Valheim Lockert. Um, the life, reign, and character of Haile Selassie. We'd like to to get into this and to uh, discuss this at, at at this particular point. <clears throat> and it's very important when we look at the present global situation, especially in the in the Middle East and and in North Africa, and the whole West and East situation. Um, between Christianity and, and Islam or the Christians and the Muslims as well as the new Africa and this new Arabia which is which is on the rise and this is very significant that the scriptures the Holy Scriptures the Holy Bible the Metaf Kedus the Book of the Seven Seals when we properly and correctly are able to understand it comprehend it and interpret it it provides us a valuable insight on what we're witnessing presently, what has preceded, and what is to come. So let's go through this uh, briefly right here and give um, the people who might be unfamiliar with what we mean when we say the fitta neges. The fitta neges. The fitta neges <clears throat> is known as the law or the justice of kings, the justice of the kings. And the fitna guess being known as the the justice of the kings or the law of the kings is a is a a sacred book, a holy book that was said to have been written in medieval times or in the Middle Ages. And this um document, the fitna guess it comprises the judicial the judicial practice it comprises the judicial practice of um 3000 year Solomonic Davidic um Ethiopia Ethiopia it is what we would know in the west what's similar to it in the west is what we hear about or what you have, may, may have hopefully you've heard about canon law there's such a thing called canon law what a lot of folks don't recognize is that um, the Western nations are really under <clears throat> the Vatican or papal canon law currently are under canon law and canon law actually which is Vatican law which is um, the Euro European Christian law it actually supersedes all other laws and the only laws that really um, you can say have a ability to um, confront this has been usually um, monarchical law in the European monarchies, and that's a whole history lesson on um, the Protestant and the Catholic religious wars again, where the Pope was was claiming kingship and wanted all other rulers and, and nations to bow down to him, and then the Protestant Reformation, which is a very important part of, um, a very important part, but little known um, section of history. Now, when we hear today, <clears throat> today we hear often said about a clash of civilizations. You might have heard that phrase or that expression being, um, thrown around a clash of civilizations uh george bush bush jr um he had stated that after 9 11 that this is a crusade and he was he, he immediately had to kind of um backtrack a little bit and rephrase that but it got out there and it was important that that was a signal that was that was let out a crusade and so this is brings us back to the main the main focus of our discussion here, um, the East and the West, uh, um, Islam and Christianity, um, 
Asia, Africa, or or let's let's say the East versus West, but it breaks down in another level when we speak about Africa, and in particular, what we would like to touch on is the New Africa, and and two great um, acts and works of Nugusa Nagas Zechopi of Kadamawi. Haile Selassie in his particular time, a very significant and you know uh, prophetic time in history, um, the time of the time, the life and time and reign of uh, uh, Kadamawi Haile Selassie. So to get some background on this, um, the law of the kings, the Fitta Negest, can be considered to be um, Ethiopic canon law. And there's a similarity, as we have mentioned, um, with the roots of what's known in the West as um, canon law or Roman Catholic canon law. But it should not be confounded with Roman Catholic canon law. But when we trace um, the Christianities back to their earliest um, inceptions, we see this split between the Roman Catholic Church or the Western Church, which later on now becomes the European, the white Western Church, Roman Catholicism, and the Eastern, and the Eastern Orthodox or the Oriental churches, which um, separated um, from the Roman Catholic Church over the nature of Christ and the differences in the interpretation of the Gospels because of some of the fundamental um, differences between the two churches, you understand, between the two great churches, the, the, the Western Church of the West, Roman Catholicism, and Protestant, the Protestant churches, and if you're a Western Christian in whatever denomination, your church has been heavily influenced by those um, wars and, 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 and ultimately traces much of its roots, much of the roots of the churches of the West comes from either directly the Roman Catholic Church or the Protestant, the so-called Protestant Reformation, which was a, a reformation on one level, but it was a rebellion to uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church, which is the mother church of Western Christianity. So the mother church of Western Christianity is the, is the Roman Catholic Church. So you might be um, um, Baptist, you might be Episcopalian, Evangelical, uh, Pentecostal, you might belong to whichever Methodist, Lutheran, whatever denomination that you might belong to. The, the roots of your church, historically and even doctrinally speaking, um, goes back to either the Protestant Reformation and prior to that, the Roman Catholic Church. But there's another tradition. There's a there's an entirely other tradition that is little known of in the West. And this is what we're speaking of here when we speak of the Ethiopic Church or we speak about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church of, of Antiquity. We speak about the Tawahido, the, the Tawahido Church, the Ethiopian Tawahido Church, or what's known today as the as the Orthodox Church. Now, law is very, very important. Law is 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 extremely important. They, the, enough cannot be said on the importance of law and its 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 collateral, which is order. So we hear about law and order law and order and most people there's a popular um television show law and order too but even behind all of that in the words we have systems that have evolved you understand so there's the western tradition the western european tradition roman uh canon roman catholic canon law then the protestant reformation which was derived from roman catholic the Roman Catholic Church, which broke away from that, but still is one of the daughters. This is where we have in Revelation where it says, Mystery Babylon, she's mother of harlots, and she has daughters. These daughters are the Protestant, are the Protestant churches in the West. And most of the churches in the West are either overtly Catholic 
or overtly Protestant. Now, when we're speaking about the Ethiopic or the Ethiopian church and the fit to the guess, it's important to um, speak of these differences because <clears throat> it's important. Yet we also will touch on, well, where there was at one time a a a a commonality in the, in other words one time the churches did fellowship together but the often disputes and 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 with new peoples and new ideas coming into early christianity it caused a lot of uh, uh friction and a lot of differences and even later on wars and a lot of the political um wranglings that we may be most familiar with nowadays a lot of the political wrangle wranglings back and forth and this whole clash of civilization and the current um global uh geopolitical picture has a lot to do with history that's why i said if you don't know history you are you are bound to to repeat it and every time you repeat a lesson you have to pay a higher price so it behooves us to learn history in the context of history and see how we have come from there like that time how this present time was predicated upon earlier times and to see some of the developments historically and some of the issues when you study history you begin to really recognize how history does repeat itself not verbatim per se but the the core elements certain certain uh, topics, themes, and even debates come round and about. They may change a little bit. Different individuals may be the champions of it, um, the protagonist or the or the antagonist of certain issues. But we have a repetition of history, and then it begins to come down to good over evil. In other words, this this war between good and evil. You understand between Christ and between Antichrist, between the the true and faithful worshipers of the true God and between those who worship the Satan, the enemy, the Telat, all right, the hater. Okay, so let's let's um <clears throat> begin off right here with um this area of the mission. Mission, the mission by Hans Valheim Lockett, the life, reign, character, and character of Haile Selassie I. And we're in this chapter, chapter 12. And chapter 12 is titled, entitled, The New, The New Africa, The New Africa. And the first sentence begins off, says, Through the initiative and personal authority of Haile Selassie, Addis Ababa had become the political capital of the whole of Africa. All right. <clears throat> so Addis Ababa, Addis Ababa became the political capital. It became the capital of the new Africa. It's important for us to understand that at the at the outset, because when we understand history, such as His Imperial Majesty's address to the the Joint Houses of um, the United States Congress. Um, May 26, 1954, he, he states that in medieval time, the same medieval time or the Middle Ages, the emperor, the Negusa Negest, or the king of kings of Ethiopia, Negusa Negest, Zetopia, is known as he or the one who maintains order between Christians and Muslims and Ethiopia has been that filter of the one who maintains order between the Christians and the Muslims, between the, the West and between the East, 
between Africa and between Arabia and in uh, Galatians, or the Galatia Sawoch uh, Malakut, the epistle known as Galatians, chapter 4, verse uh, 19 to the end of that particular chapter, if you study it, it speaks on these two covenants, these two covenants and these two sons, these two, two women, these two mothers. It speaks of, of our mother, Sarah, and it speaks of their mother, the Agar, or Hagar, it speaks of our progenitor Yisahak, and it speaks of their progenitor Ismael or Ishmael. And it's it's very important when we look at the Africa and Asia, the picture of Africa and Asia, not just today, but especially today, as we seek to comprehend and understand these these seismic uh, changes that are occurring in that region of the world known as the Middle East and uh, North Africa. The ripple effects of what has occurred and is occurring in the Middle East and North Africa are and will have great effects throughout the, the whole of Africa. And we need not bemuse ourselves or, or just amuse ourselves that it's a passing phase and there is no ripple effects that are and already um, have affected the West um, greatly. The Western powers are trying in their own way to comprehend how they could not have seen this coming. I mean, these things are happening so fast when we look at the events in Egypt and the events in uh, beginning with Tunisia and uh, the events presently in uh, Libya with Muammar Gaddafi at this, at this present time. So there is a new Africa, and we can say a, a new Arabia, so to, so to speak, or the Middle East and, and Africa is at the center of, of geopolitical affairs as well as at the center of, of biblical affairs because the same places that we have in our news is and are the same places that we find in the Bible. And the reason why a lot of modern day politicians and pundits don't understand the events that are going on in the Middle East, in North Africa, even in Africa, especially in that region of East Africa and Ethiopia at the heart of it, is because they don't understand the Bible. You understand they think that the Bible is only a kind of spiritual moral uh, book of religion but there is history and as well as prophecy that has a lot of bearing on not just the events of the past and not only just the events of the present but also the events of the future so it behooves us to see the prophetical um, connection in the events that are unfolding presently among the sons of Ishmael, you understand, or the children of Ishmael, and also recognize who are the true uh, Beta Israel, and the fact that Ethiopia, Imperial Ethiopia, and Ethiopia represents the African Zion, uh, the African Zion, as well as, therefore, thus, vis a vis the Africa's Israel, in other words, Ethiopia's Africa's Israel according to the the people of the book and the scriptures of the book and the and the historical a proper um, interpretation of the historical and the scriptural prophetical matter so what we would like to address here is um, the fitness and and Sharia some of you might have heard of Sharia Sharia Islamic Sharia law um, in the media, Sharia law has been uh, demonized by many of the uh, people in the media as being so-called a repressive uh, um, Arab or Islamic form of law and not too much has really gone in to really properly understand the significance of it. So when we were perusing some of our um, documentation such as uh, the mission rate here 
we had come to this particular chapter, chapter 12, um, the New Africa, and we found this to be very interesting and would like to share this um, on page 103. It says right here that His Imperial Majesty had achieved two great um, innovations, or really modernization, two great innovations, it says, which will, the author writes, provide a solid foundation for Ethiopia, whatever form of government it may have. So this is, this is very interesting, whatever form of government it may have. So what are these two <clears throat> great works or acts that what are these two um, great works, acts, or innovations that Nugus Negest, Nugus Negest Chin is responsible for? First, Nugus Negest, his Imperial Majesty, King of Kings, he placed the whole country, the entire country of Ethiopia uniformly under the rule of law, under the rule of law. Nowadays, we hear a lot about the, the rule of law, but we must remember that it was his imperial majesty and, and uh, imperial Ethiopia that reminded the Western powers, the New World Order globalist, even in uh, Geneva, Geneva, Switzerland, and the League of Nations, and, and the United Nations, and, and countless places, he, he warned them of the rule of law and the importance of the rule of law. So his imperial majesty not only saying that there must be international sense of the rule of law, but sought to establish the New Africa, and in particular the New Ethiopia, uniformly under the rule of law. By codifying the laws and adapting judicial practice accordingly, he made all Ethiopian citizens, and may I add here at home and abroad, because His Imperial Majesty and Imperial Ethiopia recognize many of us in the diaspora, who are known as African Americans and and Caribbean or West Indians, he, he recognized we over here also as Ethiopian citizens abroad. But he made all Ethiopian citizens equal in a legal sense. So that's the first of these two great um, innovations, which the King of Kings is almost solely responsible for providing the impetus as well as the initiative, bringing the whole country, Ethiopia, uniformly under the rule of law, codifying laws, adapting judicial practice accordingly, making all Ethiopian citizens at home and abroad equal in a legal sense. And secondly, he created a modern administration, a modern administration ridding the administrative process of class privilege and tribal distortion. Now, if you were to speak to a lot of misinformed um, Ethiopians today, and, and we have done this, and it's just amazing how little they even know about their own history, not all, but many, don't know these facts that would say that His Imperial Majesty actually did what he did not do. They would say he was about class privilege and tribal distortion. And, dist and, and that was totally opposite of his work. In fact, he promulgated the first written constitution for Ethiopia. But the reasons why it was not fully able to take a full application throughout the entire country has more to do with the process of people becoming acquainted and familiar with these changes. You understand, with these changes, if we look at many countries, even America, you understand? So it would take time for peoples and tribes to become used to the, to the new 
Ethiopian order, to the order of the King of Kings and his Christ, and for trained judges and other agents of the legal process to become available in sufficient numbers to serve every part of the Ethiopian Empire. Now, the Ethiopian Empire is not just limited to the artificial borders of what we know as Ethiopia today. It's not even just limited to even continental Africa. It is a global empire of the King of Kings and his Christ. So we as Rastafari, we have to understand that when we talk about um, doing the work of the King of Kings, we have to understand the importance as well as the apps, the application of this to the new order of the King of Kings and his Christ, which we are charged with in this particular time to become um, used to this, to become acquainted with this, to, to, to train ourselves and iron sharpen iron and, and for trained judges or the mequanant, the princes, as says, mequanant, kagibt ayuwat alochop iajochuana, what the egg is the abihir zargalich that. Princes shall come out of Egypt, and Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands to God. That word for princes, Bamarinya, is mequanent. Mequanent is the word, or one of the word for officer judges. Officer judges, those trained officer judges, or those trained judges and other agents of the legal process, the law of the king of kings and his Christ to become available in sufficient numbers to serve every part of the empire. And this challenge that his imperial majesty sought to, sought to meet and unfortunately was unable to, you understand, largely due to the adversarial hatred and, um, and, and interference of the enemies is our challenge today a new serious attitude towards matters of state had to grow out of the increasing economic interchange between the country's regions and its different social levels, the network of schools and, and government offices, and the mixing caused by military service based on the common legal order. 